at the university where I do a lot of work and, and taught biochem, there's a, one of the professors has on his door a thing that says, we believe in science. And literally every time I walked past it, I wanted to go, you're doing it wrong, you know, because it's not something that you believe in. You test it, right? Like, and that's the thing like you were alluding to about through COVID, you know, like believe in science. No, that's, that's not it. You test it. It's verifiable and repeatable. You know, that's the scientific method. That's the beauty of it. it. That's why it's not dogmatic and, you know, some sort of religious approach is you assess it. And, and the thing is, it, it, what I would always tell students is science is a point on a line, right? The best science that we have now is going to seem laughable a thousand years from now, right? What's up, guys? Welcome to the Invictus Mindset Podcast. Today's guest is an inventor, a biochemist, and a pharmaceutical developer. He's a true wizard who's making magic potions for his brand over at Wizard Sciences. He's got this carbon-60 supplement that's a compound that seems to be some sort of miracle potion. Today, we're going to take a peek behind the curtain with the man, Ion Mitchell. Welcome to the show. What's up, Bryce? How's it going, man? I'm incredibly honored to have you on the show today. You are doing some, some really innovative things in the world, but as we talked a little bit about offline, you possess this unique enthusiasm about your, your aura, and the way you operate within your day-to-day -day is just so much passion, and I, I'm hoping that our audience gets to, gets to see that and feel that through our special conversation today. Uh, I, I feel pretty lucky that I actually get paid to, uh, show up and do what I do every day. It's, it's, I get, I basically, I get to come to an insanely cool lab and play with really cool stuff and try and innovate things to help people. And that's literally exactly what I've always wanted to do. Like my entire life. So For sure, man. For our perfect. viewers, can you show them your shirt real quick? Oh yeah. <laughs> for, for people listening, his shirt says safety third. Safety third. And something that's that's really cool that Ion and I have discussed briefly is, you know, number one, it, it the most important thing is kindness. Number two, innovation, tinkering, exploring, really maintaining a childlike curiosity, and then safety comes third. And I, I don't know for whatever reason that brings a, an ear to ear smile for me. And would you, would you mind touching on how you kind of developed that little trifecta of perfection? Yeah, so the, the thing that I really wanted to have when, when I started the lab was I wanted to solve big puzzles. So I've had the same, the same six things on my board for the past 10 years, right? So when I opened the lab, six things that I wanted to solve before I died, and that's kind of been the driving force. And the, and the common thread between all of them was they were all things that were for the betterment of humanity. I mean, it mm -hmm. is kind of, you know, just sort of, you know, that sounds like I'm contestant in a beauty pageant, but really <laughs> that's, that's what I'm, I like long walks in the moonlight and I like to solve problems for humanity. Um, <laughs> you know, and that's kind of what I was shooting for. And so I really believe that if you take a bunch of brilliant people and you want to make a change, you throw them in a room and you let everybody go and do their best. And, you know, you, you don't really worry about the constraints. I mean, you're, you're going to get the same results if you try the same thing that everybody else has always done. So we do a lot of different stuff around here. We've got a segment where we do a lot of biochemistry, then there's chemistry, then there's analytics. Uh, we have a whole section that's all nanoparticles. And then we've got a full machine fabrication shop where we make, like the guys right now are making a big hyperbaric chamber. And, you know, before that, we were making a, a, a biochar production unit. To, oh my gosh. Yeah, which was cool. It makes this type of carbonaceous material that we use in concrete so we could make a carbon negative concrete so we're just trying to do things that really move the needle across the board that was global warming which has been on the board since i opened the lab you know the the biochem stuff a lot of that is aging and cancer related you know because longevity aging was actually the first thing on the board so that yeah, was, I was going to ask what those six things are in order uh aging cancer clean water uh, global warming, free energy, and superluminal travel, which is just faster than light travel. Wow. So, yeah, and, and the reason for the last one is I figure if we're going to actually become sort of an interstellar civilization, you know, somebody's got to figure out the, the way to get us there because strapping ourselves to bottle rockets, you know, per Werner von Braun, uh, <laughs> it's, not really, it's not really an effective way to go. It's kind of the last century's technology. And actually, and, we, and we've done a bunch of work on that. You know, literally we've hit... 
Uh, I mean, we haven't cracked the code on superluminal travel, but we've done some really cool stuff. You know, we have uh, an ion drive, um, not eponymously named for me, but uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but we've got uh, some things, you know, like drone tech and stuff like that using ionization drives. And there's some there's some really cool stuff. We've just kind of hit the span. You know, like I was just drinking the handy wizard water, which is this hyper oxygenated water um, that's really good for you because it either it does one of two things it either skews your pulse ox up to you know 99 or 100 or it drops your heart rate whatever the the load balancing function is that hits the best homeostasis for your body that's what it does so yeah those are the those are the things that i get to tinker with all and day, also what's day. really cool though is like you're not just tinkering with it and then basing it just on like a feeling that has some sort of bias you're looking no. at the real science like for those of you listening, he was just wearing a pulse ox on his finger while drinking the water. And I could see the real-time data as his cells and his body was absorbing that, that wizard water. Yeah, well, you know, normally water just has eight parts per million or eight to nine-ish parts per million oxygen. And so we've gotten it up as high as 228 ppm. And so, you know, that's a huge spike. And so rather than have to, you know, breathe more intensely – you just drink the water and everyone's actually running in an oxygen deficit, which is why I did that because our bodies evolved with 21% oxygen in the atmosphere. And now if you walk outside, it's roughly 19%. Mm. So everybody's running at a 10% deficit in terms of oxygen. Why is that? I just shift in the climate, shift in the environment. You know, it's, it's just changed actually it, to compensate people's respiration rate is faster than it used to be. So Would you, you say that's as a result of, of anxiety and constant stimulus and, you know, fear of missing out? I think, uh, I, th I think actually it's probably more a result of environmental stresses. A lot of, a lot of it I think has to do with, um, not so much toxic load, like the compounds in the air, but really probably a lot of it has to do with EMFs. You know, we're, our bodies weren't really designed to be processing radio frequency waves and microwaves and all the stuff that's literally just permeating our entire system all the time and you know not to get off topic but they're in your cells your, your cells regulate uh their flow of calcium right it's called voltage gated calcium ion channels right and so your cells have this very balanced homeostasis and if you disrupt the calcium ion potentiation in the flow then they the influx and the efflux shift and that skews the acidity inside your cells and if the acidity skews, that means the protonation is different. And it's, it sets up this kind of cascade where the things in your body don't function as well as they normally would, which is actually why, you know, people, I, I know a lot of people notice there was a correlation between, you know, like 5G and EMF and viral loading. Well, yeah, that's, it's actually, it's not some big nefarious plot. It's very simple. It has to do with voltage gated calcium channel flows. And if you shift those flows, the, the intracellular, um, cytoplasm, right? It, it becomes more acidic and it more, more acidic means higher proton count, more protonation means a more receptive environment for viral, viral loading. So you get more virus if you have more protons and that's just mm -hmm. you know, basic science. So, um, it's not some big nefarious evil thing, but we've, we've, we've got a built environment that's already mm -hmm. kind of dinging us. You know, a lot of the stuff I do, like, uh, I worked on a project a couple of years ago for bees and, you know, the colony collapse disorder, a lot of people said, you know, it, it had to do with neonicotinoids and that's, you know, in insecticides. And there's a def, definite component of that. But I'd also say that a huge portion of it has to do with EMF stress, right? Because they're subject as little bitty T9C insects, they're subject to the same things that we're subject to on a cellular level. And they've very clearly shown that lots of EMFs disrupt the navigation for insects and specifically for bees. And... It's it's kind of interesting actually. I was uh, I was meeting with the Nobel laureate who actually developed carbon sixty, which is kind of the backbone of a lot of the stuff that I I work on. And of all of the projects that I was working on, the one that really excited him was the thing for bees. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I just found it. You know, he was a professor in his late eighties at Rice University, a really sweet guy. And but that was the thing that seemed to to really kind of tickle his fancy was that I was trying to fix bees. There's so much to unpack there. I mean, for those of you listening, you just heard a, 
a little glimpse in between the ears of Ion Mitchell. There's a, there's a lot of different knowledge in there. You clearly really understand systems and processes and can deliver them on a very efficient basis. But my first question for you, Ion, is can you repeat those six things that were on the board? Sure. And how did this conversation start? Like where in your brain were you like, all right, I want to I want to start attacking aging first. So it, it, what, what's become evident to me over the past decade was the, I, you know, I just kind of wrote it down, literally stream of consciousness, wrote down, these are the things that I want to tackle. They're the, the things that I think are the big problems. And what are those there. things? So aging is the first yep. one, then cancer, because yep. uh, that's been an issue for quite a while. A couple, couple thousand years is, you know, if you ever read The King of All Maladies, which is a really good book on cancer, uh, you know, it traces the history back and you can go back into, you know, Egypt and find, you know, uh, records of people with cancer. So, you know, it, I'm sure it's been there all along. And the older people live on average, the more it's b become something that you see um, kind of in society at large. And now it's literally like one out of every two people gets it. So it's not, you know, but lifespans are longer. It's kind of like Alzheimer's, whatever, whatever incrementally goes down, goes down the road as we become older and older organisms, you know, something has, it's an engineering problem. Something's got to break, right? So cancer is something that I, I thought, you know, this would be a good thing to fix. Um, and then clean water and then global warming and then free energy and then superluminal travel. So um, global warming, just because it, I, actually this sounds silly, but I think we can adapt to a lot of it, but the thing that I think might get us is human nature is kind of an interesting thing. And when people's resources start to go away, they get fussy. And mm -hmm. so if, if you look at the shifts in, in global sea level rise and you displace a billion and a half people, assuming that there's no precipitous decline in human population, if you decrease that many people's resources and suddenly displace them, they'll fight for resources. You know, if people are starving, they will fight for it. I mean, historically, if you look at any civilization, anytime one out of every three people is either starving or unemployed or can't provide for their family, everything falls apart. You know, there's either a revolution, uh, civil unrest of some sort takes place, you know, or, or just some mass calamity. But that's kind of historically, if you look at that, that's about the number, like one in three things fall apart. And so if you take a billion and a half people and you suddenly pull all of their resources, they're going to get huffy and they're going to try and take it from the other people. And I'd rather not see that happen. So I figured, well, if I can curb that, you know, in any way, shape or form, it's, it's a giant, a giant problem. Um, it's something I think we can solve technologically, but it'll even, even if I had the perfect answer for it tomorrow, um, or today. I mean, I think I, I actually could knock out the, the human contribution tomorrow, really. Um, it still would take decades for it to really take effect. You know, the, the reason I developed a carbon negative concrete was specifically for that. You know, carbon, carbon emissions from concrete, uh, it's the third largest emitter. If, if, carb, if concrete were a country, it would be the third largest producer, producer of carbon dioxide in the world. Oh, man. Yeah, so it'd be wow. China, U.S., and then concrete. So it, it actually accounts for eight percent of the global greenhouse gas burden. So, for sure. What I'm so hearing too is concrete. that like there's so much complexity within problem solving within the world because it's not just about the the, the problem that you're solving; it's the implementation, the monetization, the political you know contribution, and there's a lot of different things to navigate. And so it, it definitely leads to some gentle challenge. So it's cool to zoom out and observe that you're like, all right, just like we do as in, in our day to day as humans, what's the minimal viable dose? What's the smallest thing that I can do that can have a trickle into our society as a whole that is low barrier to entry that people can implement with very seamless integration and then as a byproduct, receive the benefit. And one of those things that you've brought to the forefront for, for many of us, and it seems to be this unique biohacking thing that seems to be very popular within the health and fitness space right now, and that is this carbon-60 compound that you've briefly mentioned. Mm -hmm. what, what is it, and you know, how did you get involved with exploring 
this this unique serum? So carbon 60 is, it's literally 60 carbon atoms clustered together in a, a truncated icosahedron, also lovingly known as a soccer ball. And so it's it's got a, a bunch of interesting properties though. So when it was first discovered um, by these three guys in 1985, um, and they, they actually, they all got the Nobel Prize in 1996 for it. Um, but when they discovered it, uh, it was because they had seen it uh, in interstellar space. And so they were trying to figure out what, what had an atomic mass of 720, and it turns out it was this cluster of 60 carbon atoms. So it's just an allotropic form of carbon. An allotrope is when you have the same elemental component, like in this case carbon, but its, it's configuration is different. So you've got diamonds, graphite, carbon 60, fullerenes is an entire class. Um, and they, they initially thought that it wouldn't have biological application, but uh, eventually some people realized that you could bind it to lipids. And if you bound it to a fat, you could actually get it to move into a cell membrane. And, and kind of the seminal, the seminal study on that uh, was done in 2012, and everybody calls it the RAT study, the mm. BATI RAT study, and it's B-A-A-T-I. And this uh, this fellow Fathi Musa was the the lead on the thing, and and they they dosed all of these uh, Worcester rats with it to see what what effect would elicit you know a kind of a detrimental outcome. The LD fifty lethal dosing fifty is when you when you dose an animal and you try and figure out how much is going to kill the median portion of the population. And what they found was that the control group died, and then the olive oil group by themselves they used olive oil as the lipid base. Mm -hmm. Most of them died off, and then the C60 olive oil group lived 90% longer than the control group. Yeah, oh my which, gosh. Well, and, and I actually, my dad actually clued me into that study because I was trying to work on some longevity things. And mm -hmm. uh, he said, hey, have you seen this thing about carbon 60? And I said, no, I haven't. I, I read it, and I thought, that's got to be utter bullshit. Like a 90% extension lifespan? No way. You know, like yeah, that's that were, huge. It is huge. If that were a thing, like everybody would be beating the drum. Um, so I thought, you know what, I'll just get all the stuff and start running some experiments. So I bought all the equipment that was necessary, bought a bunch of C60 and then actually started testing it out. And, and I got P53 knockout mice, which are your P53 gene is your tumor suppressor gene. So if you buy these mice that have the P53 gene extracted when they're bred, um, it, so it's, you don't have a copy on either side. So it's a negative, negative P53 homozygous knockout. Uh, basically they, they're the, the unfortunate mice that you use in, you know, cancer work. So when you're doing an oncology study, you'll use these guys because they develop idiopathic tumors, which is just the, the medical way of saying it's spontaneous tumor formation. Mm. So they're the ones that you see with the little bulbous growths all over their bodies. So they have, because there are so many tens, probably at this point, hundreds of thousands of them that have been used they have the most accurately defined mortality curves. Like, you know, within a very narrow band, how long they're going to live. And it's, and it's a very short time if you use the, the homozygous, right? So you've got wild type, which is like the natural configuration. They live the longest, then heterozygous, positive, negative knockouts, and then homozygous have the shortest. And so in this case, I, I wanted something that would have a really short lifespan, roughly six months. And so I started dosing them with the compounds. And uh, what, I, what I found was, on average, they lived 93% longer uh, than they were supposed to, and they didn't die of tumors, which was in and of itself kind of a boggling outcome. You know, the, the first one, I did the necropsy myself, and I opened it up, and I, I was looking at it, and I thought, wow, it died of a femoral hemorrhage, right? Like, there's no, there's no tumor. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, well, you know, I'm not a vet pathologist. I don't do this all the time. I'm just, you know, basically kind of like the shade tree mechanic in terms in terms of doing, you know, a necropsy on an animal. So I thought, oh, I'll send it off to a veterinary pathologist and I'll have full histology workups done and look at all, you know, look at tissue samples and blood samples and, and just get everything drilled down. And same thing, they didn't find any any evidence that they were dying of tumors or cancers or anything like that. It was really kind of a bizarrely confounding result because they are literally designed to die of those things. And so that was just out uh, of curiosity. What was what was their diet at that time? Was it consistent amongst you know other experiments that you had done? Like, are the rats eating the same thing in all of those, or did that play a factor at all? Uh, literally peanut butter. That was okay. that was it. Yeah, it was just it was. Uh, I wanted something that would keep them in in a ketogenic state yeah. as best I could because I figure 
it's been my experience over a couple of different uh, experiments, specifically with with mice and rats, where we've done uh, orthotopic implantation of tumors, where you actually administer cancer cells into the mice or the rats, and then grow them to a tumor burden, and then administer different compounds to them to see what sort of effect you can have in, in terms of negating the cancer growth. Um, if they're in a ketogenic diet, they do really well. If they have the standard American diet, uh, it, it's unbelievable how fast cancer propagates in an environment that's very sugar and carbohydrate rich. Yeah. I mean, cancers are glycolytic in, in nature, not all of them, but the, the bulk of them are, right? So they, they want sugar and then sugar's what, you know, fuels their growth. So I tried with these guys, not intentionally, but I just tried to give them a ketogenic diet so I could have a really straightforward control and look at, you know, everybody's eating exactly the same thing. So I kept them in ketosis most of the time. That's so interesting. I mean, you you guys heard it here, 93% longer lifespan, you know, yeah. utilizing the carbon-60 compound with olive oil and yeah. on a ketogenic diet. Yeah. Um, and then how did you then segue that or bridge that gap to, you know, developing an, an optimal protocol and formula for human use? So I did two large scale clinical trials in dogs, um, you know, kind of you start out with mice or rodents and you work from, you know, the, the murine side of things where you're playing with mostly the mice and then you kind of work your way up to the higher order stuff. And so I did a two, two large trials with dogs to see what the response was with the dogs. And that was boggling because I did cytokine levels, which are inflammatory markers in the blood and then, you know, full CBC blood workups on all the animals. And it was more than compelling. The, the, actually, the thing that was the strangest to me was I realized it, it took me a while because I, I hadn't seen this before. When numbers were high, like say the triglycerides in an animal were out of range and they were high, it would pull them back to the norm. And then if they were low, it would pull them up to the norm. And it was almost adaptogenic in nature, which was really remarkable to me. So. I started doing that and working with with dogs and uh, you know and and actually before I even worked with dogs I guinea pigged myself and in, in fact before I even worked with mice I guinea pigged myself and my rationale there was you know it all the articles I read said it had a pretty good safety profile I mean it's carbon you know it's not like if you went to, if you went to the hospital for some sort of poisoning they they'd pump you full of activated charcoal because it's a binding agent and it detoxifies your system and this does the same thing and interestingly, even in the, the lab mice, when you try to knock them out, you use this thing called CCL4, carbon tetrachloride, you actually have to use more than twice the amount that you would normally use to knock them out because it's hepatically and renally protected. So their liver and kidneys are just buffered so they can handle these. It's kind of like, you know, uh, taking activated charcoal and then drinking. It just, you don't get alcohol poisoning. You, it negates the effect because it binds to the toxins and takes them out of your system, which is so why if people they, are drinking and they want to either mitigate yeah, not, a, a hangover. They should take not, the activated charcoal tablets yeah. that uh, I think Bulletproof makes on maybe, maybe a few other brands now. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say either Bulletproof or Quicksilver. They both have really good ones. Okay. And, yeah, You're giving but, so many secrets away, man. I'm sure that's like the number one thing. People are like, what? I can drink and mitigate the hangover and the and the... Actually, Alcohol well, poisoning effects? Yeah, but the the other thing is you won't get buzzed either. <laughs> so, so you'd have to drink a whole lot more. I think that I've actually had that as a complaint from people. There have been a couple of things that uh, that I've done where I thought, you know, like, oh, this is fantastic. And people have the exact opposite effect. There have been a couple of women who were already in menopause and they went back to having a menstrual cycle and, you know, I thought like, oh, that's fantastic. Look at that. You know, we've, we've biologically rolled the clock back. Now you're having a menstrual cycle again. They were actually quite unthrilled with that. Oh, geez. <laughs> so, you know, I was thinking of it from a technological perspective. Like, look at this. Look at this cool thing. We you did. made they them were, younger. They were not, they were not having it. They were not. Really <laughs> with that. So yeah. that's funny, man. I'd love to uh, unpack a little bit more around the carbon 60 compound that you were just describing. But before we do, I want to know a little bit more about you. Like as, as you're dis describing and, you know, sharing gentle peaks and valleys associated with your lab and the innovations, I I'm curious about your education. Like where did this, 
this curiosity start? What was your childhood like? What were your parents like? And how did they kind of plant these seeds to get you to like hammer and chisel all of these really big, impactful, life-changing science arenas? Um, so my mom is an artist. Uh, my dad uh, is kind of, uh, he, he's a polymath too. I mean, he was a professor and he's done everything. You know, he did law enforcement, professor, he was spec ops in the military. I mean, he's, he's a really brilliant guy and he's very adaptable. He learns things at just an obnoxious pace and, you know, and constantly reads at, a, at also an obnoxious pace. So he was always <laughs> kind of learning things. You know, he was a maritime captain, uh, could pilot, you know, huge ships and tugs and tankers and all kinds of stuff. And, um, you know, <laughs> interestingly had, uh, you know, dropped out of school because my grandfather got tuberculosis, faked his mm -hmm. age so he could join the merchant Marine and shipped out and then eventually became a maritime captain and kind of just like a really neat, neat life story. But, um, it's, it's interesting that the sort of the dichotomy between my parents, you know, like one is definitively, on the artistic front and looking at things through very creative perspectives. And then one is very rigorously scientific. And I, I think some of the things, my mom is one of the most loving and kind people you are ever gonna meet. You know, anyone who meets her just adores her because she's just a genuinely fantastic human. And my dad, uh, anybody who meets him, I think walks away going, Christ, that guy's smart. You know, and, and and my dad used to do this exercise with me when I was a little kid where he'd ask me all these questions and, you know, I'd go, well, you know, I don't, I don't think you can do that. And he'd go, well, can it be solved in 500 years? And I'd go, uh, I don't think so. And then he'd go, well, can it be solved in a thousand years? And I'd go, well, yeah, yeah. I imagine a thousand years from now, that will be an issue that's solved. And he goes, okay, well then just project yourself into the future a thousand years, look at how they did it, bring it back and then do that. And it so he set it up as if like, what is the North star? Let's position yeah. ourselves in that place. And then let's work backwards from there. Yeah. Yeah. Moving, yeah, cool. doing the math right to left. And it was really, it was a very brilliant approach. Um, because as a little kid, you don't have those, those barriers set up. You're not so obstinate. You don't go like, Oh, we can't do that. You just approach it from the standpoint of like, yeah, what well, that's doable, right? Like a thousand years from now, I can do that. It's such a unique installment of the belief system that all problems are solvable. Yeah, that actually, that was a critical component of it, um, was, was that everything is solvable. At some point, assuming humanity doesn't wipe itself out, technologically we'll progress to the point where we're capable of doing things. And one of the other things is there's this... Uh, British show that I mainlined as a kid that's still my favorite show of all time called Connections by this fellow named James Burke. And what he would do is he would take one modern invention and then he would roll it back to its very inception. Mm. And, you know, like a, a rocket today, you know, like an ICBM started out, you know, at the Battle of Agincourt or something like that, you know, and, and then he would tr trace it all the way back and say like, oh, these guys did this because these guys had developed stirrups and they were able to use it in this battle with horses and literally go point by point. And for me, it was formative because I realized like, oh, technology isn't something that just happens. It's something that's additive, right? So this guy saw this, you know, thing here and this woman developed this and, you know, it's kind of like the peanut butter and chocolate, you know, like two great things that go great together, right? So like, if you have a technology, then you add another piece to it. And that changes the base technology. And then you can do another thing and another thing. So you end up with this additive system. I mean, that's why axles are as wide as they are is because that was the width of Roman ox cart wheels, right? Like, mm. we could, we could as, as a species, we could do far better things. Um, but a lot of times it is just very additive. One of the things that I actually try and do is what, what I love about this additive approach though, that seems so cool is like, at least what I'm seeing and hearing is it's, I always view it as like a smoothie. Like in the beginning, it's like, you've, you've got one ingredient. It's like, okay, well, Bryce has this ingredient then Ion has this ingredient. Then our buddy over here has this ingredient. Yeah. And the innovation is, is really the combination of the sharing of ideas. Is that kind of what you're alluding to? That's, that's exactly it. Right. And you know, it, I, I wrote a paper um, for a, a presentation I was doing about a decade ago, and it was called Cultural Calculus, because people always say like, oh, you know, technology is expanding exponentially. Well, historically, it, it had that appearance, but I actually disagree with that as an assessment. 
I think what was expanding exponentially was population. And as population expanded exponentially, the data points went in. Now what's happening is you actually do have kind of a cultural calculus because it's a rate of change of a rate of change due to the connectivity, right? Like, so you're not really just, you've got population expanding, which gives you all the data points of everyone's individual assessments, ideation that they're doing, you know, all that sort of stuff. But then you have an entirely different axis that comes about from creativity. So now it's really like this volumetric function where you're moving out on three axes. So the, the amount of information that we have now is remarkable. And it is, it's the different points. Like you have a bit, they have a bit, I have a bit. And because we're able to speak, you know, 500 years ago, if, I, if you were working on something and I wanted to get a message to you, it was a lengthy process, right? Now it's just instant. You know, we can, Let me ask you, know, you this, though, like something that's coming into my brain right now that is so unique in the world of science is especially ov over the whole COVID pandemic. You, you've heard the phrasing trust science. And what, <laughs> what's interesting about you is like you do this awesome job of like, no, science is a point in time. This is what we know up until now. Let's screw yeah. with that a little bit. Let's tinker. Let's push. Let's pull. Let's explode. Let's poke and pry and let's let's navigate this this thing that is said to be truth and i think that sometimes there's this unique dichotomy between you know oh you're you're going against the grain too much but i mean in the world of strength and conditioning for me it's like you know i went to school for exercise physiology i have a generalized pretty good understanding of basic program design but man humans humans are complex they're also really malleable to say that they're going to fit this linear progression over the course, course of 365 days and not take into consideration the unique variables that come into context with that and the emotions that play with that. It's unrealistic. Trident Coffee is sponsoring this episode of the Invictus Mindset Podcast. My guys over at Trident taught me something really important this last year, that we are all a bundle of stories, both good and bad, and everything in between. At Trident, they're storytellers. All of their cold brews remind their customers that, that they are part of something bigger than themselves. They help create connections through symbology and storytelling that engage their customers on an emotional level, and this distinguishes them from other coffee brands. You can find Trident in Imperial Beach and in Coronado. They offer over 14 plus nitro cold brews along with dairy-free options. You can find the perfect brew and pair it with one of their treats from their keto bakery. All these options will allow you to support your health and fitness journey with Trident Coffee. They're more than just a coffee company. You can check them out over at tridentcoffee.com and use code INVICTUS20 for 20% off online and in tap rooms. Once again, that's tridentcoffee.com. Use code INVICTUS20 for 20% off online and in tap rooms. Take your coffee experience to the next level. Two important factors for us over at Invictus Mindset are true care and attention to detail. My friends over at RX Mark here have been bringing innovative fitness tools to the market since 2009. From their award-winning Evo Speed Ropes to their amazing gymnastics grips, to their line of inflatable fitness equipment, they're constantly looking to problem solve within the fitness industry. They're always allowing us to have our gear work for us rather than against us. Hop on over to RX Mark Gear and use discount code Invictus Mindset to shop their latest cutting edge gear. Have your gear work with you and not against you. And you do a really cool job of like, especially in the science world, falling into the little bit more of the creative space. Maybe that comes from your mom, but it's like there's more to the human experience and there's more to science than meets the eye. It's not just here's, here's the science up until this point. It's like, no, that's what's been researched up until this point and where the funding has gone up until this point. But there's a whole world that exists behind the curtain that you yeah. and I like are very aware of that for whatever reason is sweeped under the rug and not, not talked about. 
No, man, it's exactly like the Banksy right there. You know, that's that's what's behind the curtain is it's this vast array of Technicolor stuff. There, there was a at the university where I do a lot of work and and taught biochem. There's a, one of the professors has on his door a thing that says we believe in science. And literally every time I walked past it, I wanted to go. You're doing it wrong. You know, because it's not something that you believe in. You test it, right? Like, and that's the thing. Like you were alluding to about through COVID, you know, like believe in science. No, that's, that's not it. You test it. It's verifiable and repeatable. You know, that's the scientific method. That's the beauty of it. it. That's why it's not dogmatic and, you know, some sort of religious approach is you assess it. And, and the thing is, it, it, what I would always tell students is science is a point on a line, right? The best science that we have now is going to seem laughable a thousand years from now, right? And even if there are some of the basic tenets that we still utilize, you know, like, I mean, Newtonian physics still works. Uh, we understand a lot more of quantum physics, but we still have Newtonian physics as a basis. But still to think that all of the world is governed like that, like a clockwork mechanism is laughable. And, and we know that now. And I, and I think the same thing applies to just about everything because literally as a human, you have such a narrow bandwidth, right? Like you're picking up maybe visually 300 terahertz to 760 terahertz, right? So like you've got this little visual spectrum and that's if your eyes are great that, that you're picking up, you know, like the 300 to 760 nanometer range. And it's just, it's such a small fraction of the total EMF field that you're literally looking at like 0.0001% of everything. And I mean, do you really think if you, if somebody pushed you up to the empire state building and you had your face against it and you opened your eyes that you would be able to understand everything there is about that entire building with that perspective? No, you know, it's laughable, but that's literally as people, that's kind of, you know, that's kind of what we do, you know, give a monkey a brain. He'll think he's the center of the universe. I almost think it's getting highlighted even more too, because of the growth and development of, of news and social media, because it's like everybody's videoing everything and taking pictures of everything. So it's like, if you don't see it, it didn't happen. Yeah. But what's so interesting is like, there's so much that takes place that's not documented in, in that frame or fashion. And I don't know. I think it's important to highlight that so that we gain context. We seek to understand and realize that there's so many different perspectives you know, it, on so many different topics out there. And, and you're bringing that to the forefront in the world of science and, and testing things and tinkering with things and I'm just I'm, I'm a big fan of it because it, it elevates the conversation versus just this baseline well that that's what we're supposed to do right as as a good scientist you push the boundaries like nine times out of ten my idea will probably be harebrained and wrong but that one time out of ten or maybe even one time out of a hundred where I see something that's an anomalous data point and go ah, that doesn't fit, right? It's it's not, normally what happens is when you find stuff in science, kind of like mainstream science, and it doesn't fit, a lot of times it deviates from what you've gotten, you've received your funding for, you know, right? Like you're an H1 grant or whatever you're doing, um, or your NSF grant, like whoever is providing the funding, and you don't want to, you don't want to get banned from doing further development, right? So you follow the money, just like anything else, right? If you really want to understand something, follow the money. And if you say something that's really off the beaten path, you're going to be lambasted, right? You know, it, actually, the person who comes to mind on that front is um, a, a Nobel laureate named Luc Montagnier, who's this French physician uh, who's done, you know, decades of study on water and, you know, storing frequencies in water and using water as literally a storage medium. And his experiments are remarkable, right? Like even on the off chance that they're right, they're remarkable. And everybody kind of thinks like, oh, Montagnier's a quack. The problem is he was the guy that isolated the HIV virus and they gave him the Nobel Prize for it because he had isolated it and was beating the drum saying, look, I found this thing, it does this for three years prior to anybody else even paying attention to it. So the fact that he's a Nobel laureate kind of gives him the street cred in science that they can't just say like, oh, you have no idea what you're doing. So basically what they do is like, well, what Montagnier is developing doesn't fit in the normal paradigm. So we're just going to push it off to the side mm -hmm. and we're not going to pay attention to There's it. There's this and unique I mental construct around this is how we've always done it. And yeah. giving money so much power over the path that we choose to evoke and you see it in healthcare, right? Like 
the, oh, this yeah. whole pharmaceutical drug pandemic. It's like, is it really health care or is it some sort of I'm trying to mitigate the debt that I accrued based on the education model, most of which is around pharmaceutical drugs as well. And it, it's just so interesting to me because no matter where people lie on the p political spectrum, the answer is probably somewhere in the middle. And I think it's important to have these conversations and realize, like, hey, we can actually disagree and still have mutual respect in the messy middle because we have different perspectives on the subject matter. But what's interesting is that money is skewing studies, which is then skewing our psychology, which is then skewing our belief systems and creating so much animosity and divide, which is then mitigating the creativity and the exploration based on FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. But yeah. then there's unique individuals like you and like me trying to follow suit where it's like, I actually want to continue to push against the grain because one day all of us are going to be gone. And hopefully we can elicit something that positively impacts humanity or in your case enhances longevity of, of the human experience and decreases a little bit of, of pain along the way. Yeah. That, well, and that is a big constraint. You know, it's like you said, though, I think it's super important that people respect one another for the diversity, right? You appreciate oh, yeah. the diversity. It, it literally would be like saying, well, you know what? Only people with blonde hair and blue eyes are correct. I, and if memory serves, that was tried and it didn't play out so well, yep. you know? So it's, so it's, it's kind of like you really want diversity. You really want people with varied perspectives and you want people to realize like, Oh, these guys, they're coming at it from a different place than I am. They may have something, something viable to say, you know, I always joke that, you know, three legged stools don't wobble, you know, why a Trinity three legged stools don't wobble. You know, it's uh it's one of those things like humanity needs to be more welcoming and understanding of the other, the other people out there despite culture, you know, be agnostic to, to the culture that it's coming from. Just look kind of like a meritocracy. Like we're all going to have good ideas there. There's going to be, like you said, the truth is going to lie somewhere in the middle. And that doesn't just apply to politics. I mean, certainly that applies to just about everything. Like actually we just did this experiment that I thought was kind of remarkable uh, two weeks ago on qu quantum entanglement and biological systems. And We've done it, we've repeated it over and over because the results are very bizarre um, through the kind of the conventional lens. So there's a company that I work with called Leela Quantum and they have uh, a thing called the heel capsule and the quantum block. And so what we were doing was we were taking these cells and it was a double blinded, uh, double blinded study. So we take these cells and the fellow that they work with in Germany would send quantum energy um, to the cells. And what we would do is we would measure the ATP output of the cells before one group of the cells was charged. And then we would measure them on time points, you know, 30 minutes, one hour, two hours, four hours, eight hours a day. And without fail, hundred percent of the time. And they didn't, you know, I would send them a picture of the cells to charge. They didn't know which group it was the guys that were putting them in the incubator and then running the ATP assays on them. Uh, with the luminometer, they didn't know which was which. I was the only person who actually knew which was the control and which was the experimental group. 100% of the time, beyond statistical doubt, it changed the ATP output just by focusing, you know, quantum energy on these things. So very demonstrably, it's it's showing that there's an entanglement function in biological systems, which is remarkable. I mean, it, well, actually, given the, you know, the Nobel Prize in 2022 for physics, you know, showing you know, kind of uh, Bell's theorems that you can transfer information faster than the speed of light and that there is, in fact, entanglement. It, it's not surprising that that is something that the universe would use when it builds biological systems. It's just when you see it firsthand, it's shocking, right? Because yeah. it, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit inside the model. And one, one of the fellows is a PhD biochemist, really sharp cat that was doing the... Uh, doing the experiment and running it and testing it and putting all the data together, you know, he, he, you know, compiled and said, well, you know, do we need to do it again? Are we done? Should we write something up? And I said, no, do it, do it a bunch, you know, let's do it a bunch because it's such a bizarre result from the common thought process and what, you know, what you're always taught that I wanted to make sure that it was just beyond reproach, right? Just incontrovertible preponderance of evidence to say like, okay, 
We don't know how it works exactly, right? But we can demonstrably say it's doing it, right? It's definitely a quantumly entangled function. It's having an outcome. It's shifting the ATP levels. We can guarantee that that's going to happen 100% of the time in all the experiments we've done so far. It's probably going to continue, but we don't know why. And that, that's actually, that's the part of science that I love is because it's not a known. It's an unknown, right? Like, mm -hmm. I don't know how that works. I'm not sure what's going on there. I know what the out kind of the outcroppings of it are, and I know that we can we can do like dark field microscopy and look at blood work with the same process, and it changes the coagulation of the blood. I'll, I'll actually I'll send you the pictures. You can post them. They're they're remarkable. You know, just five minutes of exposure. That's super to cool. The, the big key blood. phrase that I heard there though is it doesn't fit the model. And yeah. what I what I want to like circle back to is you've chatted with me briefly about your relationship with your father and how he was really a genius. And, yes. you know, how, yes. how he empowered you, though, to recognize the model, have, have a little bit of pattern recognition, and then challenge that a little bit and, and have the, the empowerment to do so without, like, looking over your shoulder. And, you know, I'm very curious how that value system was, was instilled into your psychology and then your actionables later on in life. It, it was an open questioning, right? It, it, there was never a penalty for having the wrong answer. I, I think the only time that, that there was really, and it wasn't so much a penalty, but um, any sort of detriment was if I didn't think, you know, like he always used to say, you know, students would come up and go, you know, oh, is this going to be on our test? Is this on the final? And he always told me that, you know, life is the test. It doesn't matter how you perform, you know, what your grades are. It's about the knowledge base that you accrue and what you do with it. And that was pivotal. I mean, he, he would constantly ask me questions. Like I remember one of them was, there's a bear. The bear walks one mile due south, one mile due east, and one mile due north. And it's back at its starting point. What color is the bear? And you kind of, you know, it's like, what? But then you, you start to think about it and you go, okay, where can you walk due south, due east, due north, and be back at your starting point? The North Pole. It's a white bear. It's a polar bear. You know, mm. but it was constantly, it, it was things like that to sort of break the paradigm of what what are you missing? What is, what's outside of the bounds? And 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 it really was, it was a constant push to to be better, you know, like one of the, one of the things that my dad gave me was this book on how to enhance your genius. And one of the exercises, this is one of the sillier things I've probably ever done was to go into a very loud public place and make really obnoxiously loud animal noises. So I went into a Barnes and Noble and went like, ca -ca, ca -ca, brrr, ca -ca. <laughs> and you know, like people look at you like, who is this jackass? And but but the the reason is if you're going to really push the bounds, a lot of the stuff you're going to say and a lot of the things that you're going to think are going to be looked upon as being completely moronic and stupid. Mm -hmm. And you have to get past your own ego and your own fragility and say like, yeah, they're going to think I'm a complete moron. So be it. You know, I'm going to run down the path. I may be wrong. In fact, the probability is that I will be wrong. But on the off chance that I figure something out, totally worth it. You know. It's, um, and there, there are a lot of things like that. Like there, there's the story of, you know, the, the guy who comes in to teach, teach a class on innovation like this and says like, okay, our problem is we have power lines that are freezing up and we need to get the ice off the power lines, you know, no ideas out of bounds. What do we do? And, you know, some guys in the back of the class are kind of laughing and he goes, okay, what, what are you guys saying? And they're like, oh, nothing, nothing. And he says, no, just go ahead and tell us. And he said, well, we were saying that maybe we should get a bear and the bear would shake the power lines you know, to knock the ice off. And everybody laughs and he goes, no, let's run with it. So how does the, how does the bear get drawn to the power lines? And they say, well, I don't know, we, we, put, we put a pot of honey on the power lines. And somebody says, well, how do we get the power on the, or how do we get the honey on the power lines? And they say, we fly it up with a helicopter. And then somebody goes, wait a second, the compression and rarefaction from the blades of the helicopter will literally shatter the ice off the power lines. And that's what they actually do now is they fly over it and just the compression and rarefaction fractures the ice. And wow. Yeah. And, and it I just mean, shows how the sharing of ideas can literally yeah. unmask potential solutions to really major problems. Yeah. And, and you have to, you have to look at it from a standpoint of just laughing. I mean, I cannot tell you like how many times in the process of trying to figure something out, it, like it's hilarious, right? Because we come up with some, 
outlandishly stupid ideas. Play is the greatest form of learning, man. Just kind of tinkering, sharing back and forth and like, you know, throwing out different ideations without fear of repercussion. And actually the shirt, the, uh, the explosion, I was in the process of coming up with, you know, a way to hyper oxygenate and hyper hydrogenate. Um, uh, because we do it with molecular hydrogen too. Um, a way to do that, I actually blew up part of the lab, you know, and it was it was, albeit kind of a dangerous experience. But you know, at the end of the day, we were able to do something and stabilize molecular hydrogen and water and overcome a thing called zeta potential that nobody else had been able to do. But it was kind of you know, we we started out with a, a bunch of ridiculous equipment and some kind of harebrained ideas. We blew up part of the lab in the process, but at the end of the day, we innovated, right? And came up with something that I think will really have profound impact in a positive way for people. But, you know, through the whole the whole process, it was hilarious, you know, like buying pressure cooker systems and screwing around with ridiculous stuff, trying to figure out how to make things work. That's so cool, man. Fast forward a little bit, you know, as, as these values were being instilled in in your upbringing a little bit and your, your dad doing such a great job of allowing questions, but also challenging you to critically think versus just giving you the answer. What was your education like? And how did you start to create structures and systems into appropriate actionables to, you know, lead a lab and manage people and create implementation that is now very structured and, and really implemented within a professional setting? Uh, Curiosity. I, I remember asking my dad one time, I, I literally just asked, I said, how do you know so much about so much? And he said, oh, that's easy, brain nibbling. I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, anytime I'm curious about a topic, I learn as much as I can possibly learn about that topic. I will delve as deeply as I possibly can into whatever it is. Now, come to find out, there, there's a, a stroke of genius there that neither he nor I knew at the time, you know, this is probably 40, 40 years ago that he told me that. And what the real stroke of genius was, is when you are emotionally engaged, everything drops into your long term memory, right? Like if you're nobody has to tell you what your favorite part of your favorite movie is, you remember it because you're emotionally invested. And so the more the more emotionally invested you are in something or like really excited about it, you'll remember it forever. And that's that's actually one of the you know, the things that I think has been really beneficial for me is I'm genuinely pretty exuberant about all the stuff that I get to do. You know, the other day I memorized 72 digits, you know, in a row because I needed them for parcels I was supposed to ship out. And, it, you know, that's actually, that's like not really that tricky if you actually are really into what you're doing. It's a trainable function. You know, it comes a little easier to me probably, but yeah, I was going to say it, it's, it's going to take a little effort for some of us, but Definitely. Yeah. I love the way you describe that a trainable function and it also is. really cool that you remain like so unfixed in your mindset. You're not just like, ah, that's too hard, way out of my reach. Like you're, you're actually just willing to enroll in the process and you want to participate in, in the learning experience. And I think that's even, even more valuable because you, you just want to play and you're not just like scoffing at the challenge. No, one of the uh, one of the technicians here at the lab um, who does a lot of the work on oncology stuff. Um, she, she was uh, she's into you know she's studying physics and she was memorizing pi and I was like ah uh, that's cool so you know I just you know we kind of took it up as like a function around the lab where we were goofing around trying to memorize pi to more and more and more decimal places and it is it's it's just kind of it's play you know it, and everybody's mind. Uh, is very highly neuroplastic if you let it be, right? If you have to learn something, you will. If you want to learn something, you will. If you look at it or look at it as a very crystalline function where, you know, your your mind is just like, this is what I know, this is, this is it, you're done, right? That's why most people's IQ um, declines after they leave college, right? Because they're not, they're not trying to do anything, right? With, with the exception of people who meditate a lot, right? That's, that actually has an inverse correlation to age. The older they get, apparently the smarter they get, uh, which is kind of handy. And it's actually, you know, I meditate all the time, you know, for stress relief, but also just for cognitive capacity, because I've found that, you know, I haven't done any definitive study on myself, but 
I'm not the same person that I was when I was 20. My mm -hmm. brain functions so much more effectively now than it did then. I'd and love to dive into that a little bit. I know we've, we, we spoke a few months ago around your 28 years of meditation. Yeah. You know, what, what does meditation mean to you? And what does your meditative protocol look like? And then lastly, what has been like the, the formative transitioning as you've overcome traumas, you know, found unique answers to, to very challenging solutions and continued to push the boundaries in a world of, you know, wanting to put a, a leash on a really curious dog? So it started out, I think my kind of my initial um, shot at doing anything early was when I was uh, nine, I started having massive migraine headaches. So between mm -hmm. nine and 11, I was having massive migraine headaches three to four days a week. And it was debilitating. I'd come home, cry, put an ice pack on my head, lock myself in a you know dark room with the ice pack on my head and fall asleep crying usually because of the pain was just ridiculous. And, you know, I had PET scans and CAT scans and nobody could find anything. Um, so on a whim, my dad said, you know, there's this new thing, uh, biofeedback. Let's, let's try that. And so, you know, I got hooked up to the, all the, the EEG leads. And, and when you're actually looking at a screen and you can see like, Oh, well, if I do this, my heart rate changes, or if I do this, my blood pressure changes, or if I do this, my brainwave state changes, it makes it really easy to see. And so then over time you develop complete control over what are supposedly, as I was taught, your autonomous nervous system functions, which are anything but, right? You can control all of that. You can change the temperature of one specific spot on your hand, you know, five or 10 degrees in comparison to one that's directly adjacent to it. Once you do that, it's a lot easier if you have the electronics there and you can actually see a readout. So you, you know, like this is working, this isn't working, but it's trainable. And I, I mean, you know, from all the practices of antiquity, you know, people doing traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurveda and things like that, you know, the, the guys who did, you know, martial arts around their chi in China or their, you know, prana in India, that's all the same thing, right? People are harnessing the innate capacities of the human and just expressing it through different linguistics, but the same concept. And so that was kind of my, my introduction. And then when I, uh, when I was out of college, maybe two years, I was really hell bent on trying to figure out what I was missing. Cause I, I really felt like there was more to reality than I was seeing. It, it was kind of a, it's like a splinter in my mind. I just knew that there was a bigger perspective to things going on than I could, than I could actually see. And so I read, you know, a ton of theology, philosophy, comparative religion, and literally almost everything always pointed back to the people who really got it, um, or were enlightened or whatever, you know, kind of cultural nomenclature you put on it, they all basically followed the same protocol. They kind of were quiet and still went inside themselves. And then that unfolded and allowed them to become more than they had previously been. And so I started trying to, uh, trying to meditate and it was, you know, it, it was pretty paltry at first. I didn't do a really good job of it. And then the first real kind of foothold I got was when I started doing transcendental meditation, the TMs, just mm -hmm. like straight up TM. That was the difference between, you know, sitting there in the dark with my legs crossed and, you know, actually having a meditative practice. And it was kind of like riding a tricycle versus hopping on a plane. I mean, the, the pace was remarkably different. And so, you know, at first it's difficult. And, and actually, I think the biggest thing since now I've, you know, I've taught it um, for quite a while now is uh, people always think that they're doing it wrong because their brain doesn't shut down and they don't quiet all of their thoughts. And the reality is you're not doing it wrong. That's just not how that works, right? It's bef before you go into a state of samadhi or nervi kalpa samadhi where you're, you're stable and you're able to come back and be in that space while you're engaging and while you're doing all of this stuff around here. It's a tremendous process usually. I mean, there, there are a few people who just kind of spontaneously pop over, but that's, you know, that's few and far between, you know, Nisgar Dada Maharaj. I want to touch on that a little bit. You, you mentioned right or wrong. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's such a, a, a trained mindset of this is good, this is bad, this is right, this is wrong. I, I think from a science approach, it's like, no, it's just a data point. You learn from each one that's of those it. experiences. 
But yeah. sometimes in the cultural conditioning, you get, you get labeled, then that elicits an emotion. That emotion elicits a physiological effect. And then it's almost like, oh, that's hot. Don't want to touch it. Or yeah. that's cold. Don't want to play. I'm going to stay right here where I have you know, really, a real safe space. But then you never really get exposed. You start to exist versus live. It's like and that I, shame spiral. Yeah. And, and I think you, you described it really well there. But can you define transcendental meditation for people and then – you know, what it's like to, to kind of gradually unravel Pandora's meditative box because the brain starts to dance. You start to judge yourself. You start to unlock past, present, future. But in reality, the goal is – it's like what they say when you go to yoga. Just make it to your mat. Make, make it to the art yeah. of practice. It's not really like you're trying to score 50 points. It's like, no, I'm here. Yes. That's 100% spot on, man. I just I, – that's – it's part of the reason I love your approach, right? Is that that's it. You just you just have to show up, right? It doesn't you, you know it doesn't mean you're going to become the next Buddha. You know that's that's probably statistically speaking, I think there's a real slim chance that any of us are going to become. But but the here's next. the thing about Buddha. This is a narrative that we know about him. He also yeah. probably had challenges along the way. He's innately flawed because he's human, or at least some sort of human. And, and inevitably had, you know, stress factors and all kinds of things that are evoked within this, this human journey that we're on. So his narrative is very heroic, as I'm sure yours will be. But at the same time, like, there's a lot to his experience that we don't, like, talk about or isn't highlighted in, in the record books. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, he, that, that's one of the things that always kind of blows me away is there are 8 billion people on the planet having lives that are every bit as rich and complex as yours or mine, you know, that that's just a divine palette truly. So for me, the, the meditative component is literally, it's just, it's a quieting of the mind. Right. And, and that's actually, I think the thing that I love about it is because even when you're asleep, you know, you're in REM sleep, your brain is humming, right? That's why your eyes are twitching is your brain is still moving. Right. And you know, you're still having brainwave states um, the transcendental meditation part, I, there are a lot of different types of meditation. I, I kind of am partial to the mantra meditation and perhaps just because it was the first thing that I was really exposed to when I actually, I got my first mantra when I was seven, my, my dad gave me one that was this old Buddhist mantra, Namu Myoho Renge Kyo. And I still remember it. And I asked him, I, this was one of those things where, again, there are kind of no boundaries. I said, can people fly? And his response literally was, "Yogis can." And you know, yogis and can of, or can't. Can. can. Oh, I that's said, cool. Well, what's a yogi? And you know, he told me this story about when he had lived in India and some of the strange things he had seen. And for him, it was a matter of you know, first person experiential fact. Like he had seen these things that were anomalous that didn't fit into the paradigm. But instead of just saying, "Oh, I've got some cognitive dissonance. I'm going to box this out and never talk about it," he was like, "Well." I don't get it. I don't know how it works, but these guys are doing something different than I'm capable of doing. And mm. so for me, I was like, oh, well, okay, if that's a thing, how does that work? And he's like, well, you know, yogis have a mantra. I'm like, all right, give me a mantra. You know, and I literally just wanted it so that I could kind of, you know, do cool stuff, which is probably like the most ridiculous approach. But as a kid, right, that's like, that's what you want is like some special ability or some neat thing to be able to do. And, you know, fast forward, you know, 15 years, and then I, you know, I actually get a mantra and start working on it. And really, the thing I like about that is you don't, you, you, it's repetitive, right? Because your mind is constantly cycling, especially mine, because it's really agile and very active. And I'm constantly working on three or four different problems in, in a given day. And, and that's actually, that's how I like it. I, because I like to have multiple projects that I'm working on so I can go from one to the other, to the other, to the other, because a lot of the actual processing happens in the background when you're kind of mentally diffuse, right? It's that diffuse focus. Like I'll hyper fixate on something, work on it cognitively with kind of like, you know, my conscious mind, and then I'll push it aside and I work on something else, but I know that the wheels are churning in the background subconsciously and processing and working out puzzles, which is why I think a lot of times, you know, you wake up from a dream, you know, and you're like, Oh, I get it. Ah, you know, you have that cognitive. Snap. I love that you touched on that. I, I recently read an article from a really close friend from, by uh, Alan Watts mm -hmm. and he was kind of discussing the, the single minded modality approach to the mind where, 
you know, we, be, we become so fixated or focused on said task and, you know, we're in such a distracted world, you know, we kind of, everything else fades to the background and we focus yeah. on that one point, you know, and that may be, I want to make my business better, or I want to become a better athlete, or I want to, you know, maximize my leadership potential, what, whatever the thing is. And he was talking about how that obsessive style behavior actually decreases the outcome of performance because you're so hyper focused on one that it actually mitigates your ability to toggle and problem solve, solve in the background. As you talked about, um, your lenses are so fixated on that little piece of the Eiffel Tower that you don't have the ability to perspective shift. You don't have the ability to you know, bounce ideas off of others because you're relatively closed-minded. This episode is brought to you by Mush. My friends over at Mush created an incredibly cool product of ready-to-eat overnight oats. And for those of you that listen to the podcast often, you know simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. And Mush has done just that, as their products have no more than seven clean ingredients that are dairy-free, gluten-free, with no added sugar. Mush started right here at Invictus as they had a vision to create convenient, healthy, and clean nutrition. And this landed them on Shark Tank, where the famous Mark Cuban invested in them. Now they're found in retailers all over the country, including Costco, Sprouts, Target, and Whole Foods. Check out my friends over at www.eatmush.com. And what I love about what you're saying, and I think why you're so able to to innovate in so many different arenas within those six topics that were on your board right from the very beginning, is because they're related to meaning. There's a deep underlying meaning and what I would describe as a why identity. You have a why associated with something that's very purposeful and meaningful as to why you open your eyes and put one foot in front of the other every single day. And I highly recommend that for people. Like when you look at a spoke in a wheel, there, there's the nucleus, right? Maybe that's our value system, our love, our kindness, what you and I kind of discussed a little bit offline. But then each one of those spokes within the wheel is a little bit different. Maybe there, there are a few different projects. Maybe there's a few different relationships. Maybe there's a few different roles that we play. You know, father, husband, uh, leader, um, scientist, all, all the different hats and the titles but also encompassed within that nucleus is the biological component of being more human. Yeah. And I can't help but throw my fishing line into that concept of, of, of being more human when it comes to you, Ion, because you, you just get it. I, I can't quite you know quantify it, but you talked about it a little bit on another podcast where I think the audience is able to hear right now how I'm gaining – unique subconscious access to ideation that I don't normally have access to because I'm taking the neural RX that you have suggested to me. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I wrote on a caption on on an Instagram story, if you know, you know. (laughs) And that's one of those things that can't necessarily be quantified by science or a metric yet, right? The power of yet. But I think people can hear the toggling of information, how I'm able to bridge the gap within transition and bring all of these ideations full circle. And you've developed some of these carbon 60 formulas that allow knucklehead curiosity thought leaders like myself that are pushing against the grain and not afraid to get punched back in the face anymore to to push boundaries and have these unique conversations that elevate and delegate everybody to their peak expression. Well, on the case of that particular, I literally have mine mine here, um, <laughs> not as a prop because I actually take it every day. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it, it was developed um, for people with Alzheimer's, right? That's that's what I did. And so, if you don't have some huge cognitive deficit, it's rocket sauce. You know, I mean, it's just like you know, a lot of the guys around here call it brain sauce, brain juice. You know, and and it really is. It's great because if you don't have a cognitive deficit, all of the components that make it phenomenally good for people with Alzheimer's or some sort of like pandas or something like that, um, 
elicit this ridiculous response in, in your own neurology, right? Like, so you, you upregulate ATP inside the neurons, you stimulate the glymphatic system to use uh, cerebrospinal fluid and interstitial fluid to wash your brain at night. Uh, it kicks out new neurons at a rate of about two or three to one uh, over BDNF and NGF1, which are brain derived nootropic factor and neural growth factor one. So you're getting all these like super outpaced components and, you know, for somebody like you, that's always kind of pushing themselves mentally, it makes a difference because your body is always kind of balanced around finding this perfect homeostatic spot, right? And so your neurons are insanely resource consumptive. Your brain accounts for two and a half to three percent of your body mass, but it sucks in 20 to 25 percent of your total oxygen utilization. Mm. That's really super resource consumptive. So every day your body kicks out new neurons but it has this process called synaptic pruning. And if you don't need the neurons, it kills them every day, right? Makes new ones, kills them. Makes new ones, kills them. But if you're taking this, you're getting three times the new ones, roughly. And what I always tell people is put yourself under cognitive load, learn something new. And it's not just like, like for me, it wouldn't be learning something about a, a compound that I've already worked with, learning some new fact about it. It's learning something entirely different. Like I always tell people, juggle learn a new instrument, learn a new language. It's so funny you say that because uh, ironically, those are things I've been leaning into. I'll like be mobilizing with some lacrosse balls and I'll start to juggle a little bit. I should actually have a new guitar here in a couple days. Nothing fancy, just like tinkering with it. Cause I was like, man, I mentioned that. I want to, I want to explore that boundary a little bit and be a little bit curious in that space, which is, it, it's super cool, man. What, what you seem to be doing and, you know, for our listeners, I also want to like share a little bit of personal experience now from your lens where, correct me if I'm wrong, but roughly, what, four months ago, you were in a pretty serious motorcycle accident? Well, what's the time frame yeah, on that? Three, three months ago, yeah. About three I, months ago, you were in a very serious... Six days. Yeah, three months and six days ago, my I was in a horrible motorcycle wreck. I face planted doing 65 miles an hour, hit a patch of gravel, lost control of the bike, uh, face planted at 65 miles an hour, rolled the bike on top of myself. My femur ended up inside of my tibia. And so the, the femoral condyle, the kind of the curvature on the bottom of your femur, which is, you know, the top leg bone, the big one, punched into the tibia down an inch and split it down six inches. Mm. So it was, <laughs> you it was, explain it so well. And I'm over here like, Ooh, ah, yeah, it, was, it, was, <laughs> it, was, it was a bad hit. And my collarbone just was severed in two. And it was a, yeah, it was a, it was a rough hit. And so, you know, I, the, I got taken to the ER in an ambulance. And yeah, interestingly, it was one of those things where I was laying there and literally just moments after I had wiped out a kid pulled up in a pickup truck. Cause I was out on a country road in the middle of nowhere um, and this kid pulled up literally in a matter of minutes and said, Hey, do you need an ambulance? And I said, yes, I need an ambulance. So he called the ambulance and literally three minutes later, an ambulance showed up and I thought, Oh damn, I blacked out. And I, because I was in the middle of nowhere and they shouldn't have been able to get there that quickly. And I, and I asked the EMT as they were putting me on the gurney, I said, how long did it take you guys to get here? And he said, Oh, about three minutes. I said, How's that, how's that even possible? And he said, well, literally we were at the turnoff at the highway right when the call came in. So we just hooked a left and came out here and I was like, wow. Good that's... karma. You must be doing <laughs> something right, man. Fortuitous timing. So then I took world's bumpiest 30 minute ride back into uh, the town yes. to get to the ER. Which just is a great. little like love tap to remind you that you're still alive. Oh, oh. Yeah. You know, it's funny because when I would look at my leg, my leg would go down and then it would go off at this very unnatural <laughs> angle. <laughs> because because the femur was still wedged inside of the tibia and and i got to the er and it was it was not so good and the you know the the orderlies were like oh we're gonna take you in and get a ct scan of your leg and so they they brought me in and i i cautioned them because i'm i'm a pretty big guy i was like you know a little heavier than you might think and they were like oh we got this we do this all the time and they pulled me off of the sheet and hooked my foot on the ct scanner mm. and actually Mm. Stopped it. Yeah, it was brutal. That was actually the. What I love though is just. I mean, you must have been taking the the neural RX here because the depth and detail within your storytelling is very analytical and specific. Like for me, I probably would have blacked out, or I would have just been like gruesomely obsessing 
in a cyclical style patterning of, of the pain of the pain loop. Well, it was funny. Actually, the thing in retrospect, the thing that was the neatest to me was that I never became like really despondent or upset. I knew I was, you know, physically broken. That was obvious because because I, you're not supposed to bend that direction. Um, <laughs> But but I was you know I kept asking the uh, the EMTs for my for my stats and you know like going okay what are my vitals at because I, I wanted to know and I and I knew I was in shock physically you know and and it was nice and this is one of the things that happens after you meditate for a long long time I was just about you, to take take the conversation there you beat me to it man yeah, you get this kind of differentiation where you realize like you know I I use this it's a great vessel I love it I appreciate it I take care of it. But it's just that, right? There's there's a, a distinction between the essence of what is a person and what is their physical form. And so, you know, yeah, the the vessel was broken and cracked um, and not feeling so good. But but it's just a, it's a thing to be processed and surrendered, and you just move through it. And what's and, so cool too is that when there's consistent application of the mental work and the meditation and the exercise, the the mobility, the, the 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 cognitive challenge, and simply doing the right thing when nobody's watching, it's not effortful in the midst of chaos and controversy because it's ingrained in the habit formation. So as a byproduct, it's like, oh, chaos detected, uncertainty, pain, press button, activate protocols that I've actually ingrained for the last 20 plus years. It's yeah. just innately part of who you are. Versus like the first 10 times you meditate, it's like your mindset's playing ping pong. You hate every second of it. You're just thinking about how uncomfortable you are in the different positions. But then over time, these access points become more feasible to to gain. And yeah, use. and the rapidity. Yeah, the rapidity with which you arrive at that point is very, very different, right? So like what I'm you- hearing here is that meditation and some of these protocols are literally the greatest insurance model because you can use them with little – Little payment up front, but then when you need them most, they're there. It's just like fitness, right? You can't go like, oh, I'm going to go to the gym and work out 15 hours today. I'll be good. You know, <laughs> like you've got to do it. You've got to do it progressively over time. You can't just roll in and be like, oh, you know, I'm going to have an emergency tomorrow. I've got to run a marathon, so I'm going to go train today. That's not how it works, right? It's you, you put in the work and you do the training and the conditioning consistently for however long is necessary for the task. In my case, you know, life was the task, and I, I just I was lucky that I had I had put in the time, um, so that I I didn't I I, I actually I remember looking at the uh, the studies where they took monks and they would take uh, the sound of a baby crying and they would play it for people while they were doing an fMRI, and they would notice the part of the brain that lights up and people would have an instant response right so you hear a baby crying and then you biologically have this imperative where you mm. move over and, and you want to do some sort of physical response. Well, that doesn't happen for people who had meditated, you know, for 20 or 30 years, you get the signal, then you process what you want to do and then you act on it. Right. So you're not reactive, you're active and mm. it just gives you the choice. It puts the choice back in a domain that's under your conscious control. I also and- love that because it allows for gentle and appropriate separation between logic and emotion. Yeah. Very much so. You know, it's one of, one of the interesting things about logic and emotion that I always find funny is that the, you can't always find words for an emotion because the substrate of emotion is far deeper than the substrate of linguistics. Thus right? music. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's, that's so, yeah, that's so much the case. That's, this is so cool. Like we're, I feel like we're finishing each other's sentences a little bit, but the other thing that I love to say is that, um, Language is an approximation of what we're actually trying to convey. It's a form of hieroglyphics. It's a huge reason why email and text oftentimes gets misunderstood, misrepresented. Tone can be manipulated based on, you know, pre-factors, post-factors. But as a byproduct, like, I don't know, it's really cool when you can feel the energy and the frequency of somebody. You can observe body language. And there's, there's a wide array of information input and processing <laughs> versus just the specificity and semantics of the verbiage. You know, it's funny. I was having uh, I was having coffee with my oldest son and my second oldest son uh, about two weeks ago, and we were t- we were talking about cancer, and and one of them said, "Dad, you cannot say stuff like that. Like you realize 
that you sound like a super villain when you say stuff like that. I'm like, what are you talking about? They're like, it's only because people realize that you're like super loving and they interpret it from the standpoint of you being loving and caring about other people that you don't sound like somebody who should be petting a white cat. I was like, what do you mean? And then, and then one of them starts to, you know, just mimic back and says what I said with the accent of like, so then if they bring the disease to themselves for expression, even if they die, that's their choice. He's like, you can't say that, you know, like it's, <laughs> it sounds horrible. But when you, when you do like so little of what is conveyed is like the actual wording and the linguistics, you know, 80% or more of it probably is, is the vibe behind it. And, mm -hmm. you know, like you can see that in a person's body language and they're caring. One of the things that uh, Stephen Covey said this, uh, and I thought it was truly brilliant was he said, who you are translates louder than anything you can say or do. And yep. I think that has honestly been like a saving grace for me because oftentimes I will say something that is, completely boneheaded, but people know that their, their interpretation of it is that, oh, well, you know, this guy means it, it's coming from a space of love and understanding and not from, <laughs> not from the standpoint of like being some nefarious bastard who wants to, you know, like, -ha -ha -ha, you know, take, take down the world. It's like, just watch the key and peel skit about, uh, you know, mis misinterpretation of a text. That's, that's about it, you know? <laughs> I, I think it's so cool. And, and honestly, I had to take a moment to write that down. Who you are translates more than anything you can say or do. And I, I, I harp on this, man. I feel like I'm repetitive, but there's just more to the human experience than meets the eye. There and is. you're exploring that and you're, you're playing with that. And going back to your injury, man, you know, you, you had some pretty severe injuries. You had this bumpy road, you know, with the EMTs. You're headed to the hospital. What what kind of came next in, in the so, recovery process and kind of the understanding of, of all, all the different injuries that you experienced? It it was a it was a really bad accident. So the, the orthopedic surgeon came in, you know, after he had the CAT scans and uh, said, Listen, uh, it's a bad accident. Like we're gonna have to put you under a general anesthetic and then we're gonna have to slice your leg kind of like from mid thigh to above my calf. Mm. And we're going to have to put plates and pins and screws in, you know, there's, there's no other way to fix this. And, and I said, like, that's, that's the best we've got. And he said, yeah, it's actually, it's pretty rough surgery. And, you know, um, you'll be able to see the metal sticking from the outside of your body. And I said, you know, I'm not really up for that. I said, I, I think I'm going to take a different approach. So I actually, I called the guys on my staff and said, listen, I need you to go out and buy a hospital bed and set it up at the lab. And so they did, they went out and got, you know, fully automatic hospital bed and set it up at the lab. And then I got myself discharged from the hospital and my staff showed up and they loaded me into a Toyota Sequoia. Like I was a wounded dolphin yes. on, on sheets, pulled me across uh, off the gurney into the back of an SUV and then drove me to my lab, opened up the bay doors and unloaded me onto a hospital bed. And I thought, you know, this is this is actually kind of a, a good test, right? Proofs in the pudding. Like this guy, the orthopedic surgeon said, it's going to be 12 weeks before you can put any pressure on your leg whatsoever. Like it's bad. And yeah, I mean, it, admittedly, it was split down six inches. So it was not, you know, it was not a, not a good shot. And, and there was a ridiculous amount of swelling and a lot of pain. And so I thought, okay, well, proofs in the pudding here, right? This is a good opportunity for me to be like the consummate biohacker and actually show what I know and how it works and what I'm doing. So I started doing uh, pulsed electromagnetic field therapy, um, a lot of topical stuff, a lot of the nanoparticle stuff, the C60 stuff, uh, energy work, uh, red lights, lasers, infrared lasers, you know, it, V cell therapies, the very small embryonic like stem cells. I did a course of six, six injections of those over seven weeks. And, you know, and I was, I was literally back up, and I'll be it on crutches at the 11 day mark. And then mm. I back up. I mean, today is, is uh, I think, yeah, 12, 12 weeks and six days today, actually, that we're recording. Give this. us a little twirl real quick. Like you did for me before. Here we go. So, able yeah. To, uh, woo! So yeah, it's far better than, you know, what they were telling me. The prognosis was like 12 weeks and no weight on your leg. And, you know, I'm, I'm walking and granted, my my calf muscle isn't as strong as it was and my quad isn't as strong as it was because there's there's definitely you know some muscle wasting and a little sarcopenia kind of going down there um mm -hmm. but 
you know, that's that's to be expected for less use over the span of a couple of weeks. But the, it's coming back super fast, and I'm able to walk without crutches and do, you know, pretty much everything now. Totally. For people that have experienced, you know, tremendous injury like this or are trying to repair something without surgery, um, what would be maybe a starting point for them? You know, would you would you recommend getting some imaging and an MRI? Would you not? Because then it elicits, you know, a, a whole slew of cognitive issues that come with that. And then if you were to pinpoint, you know, some some cost effective things where people can start, you know, would you start with the stem cell? Would you relate to PRP? Like what are some things that you'd recommend right off the bat? So probably the, the two things that I think move the needle the most were pulsed electromagnetic fields. So if you read the, the studies on, you know, what happens with PEMF and, you know, bone growth, it's remarkable. Like there, there are just some remarkable healings that take place. And you can do it. There's a, there's a couple of technologies. There's electrical stimulation for bone growth. Uh, there's uh, the electromagnetic stimulation. And there's also acoustic stimulation. And all of those trigger uh, additional bone growth, right? So you're, you're getting these, you know, osteoblasts um, and you're starting to push stuff out there. And and what happens is like you get more and more of the, the uh, little calcium tubes that are called trabeculae that, that move across the inside of your bone you, and it starts to grow and increase density. Um, but the, the pulsed electromagnetic fields, that was great because I literally, I was immobile because it hurt so bad I couldn't move. And I would just put these coils and I used a, a product from a company called Pulse Centers, which is a real heavy duty PEMF coil. And I would put them on both sides of the joint and just let it go for an hour at a pop. And I would take mm. one hour on, two hours off, one hour on, two hours off, and just kept cycling it all day. And then... Um, where can people get access to that? You, there are a lot of places where you can go that have them. So you wouldn't be able to do that frequently. Or in my case, I actually looked up a vet because a lot of times you see the best technologies for uh, regenerative medicine come from either horse racing um, like they're in the horse racing world or they're in the spec ops world. And then weightlifting is probably the third, right? Yeah. So in that order, horses, special operators, and then weightlifters. And so this, I, I called a vet because there's a very large vet school at, at Oklahoma state. And so I called a vet that was there and, uh, said, I'd like to rent your, your PEMF unit. So I rent, rented the unit for a month. And, you know, it was far cheaper than buying them. They're, they're about 40,000 bucks to buy. Oh, my but, gosh. Yeah, they're pretty expensive. But, you know, you can rent one for a couple hundred bucks. So I rented it and just used it the whole time. And that I think that was the, the single biggest needle mover. And then right behind that was the, uh, the very small embryonic-like stem cells. That was, that I think is great. Because those things are, they're really interesting to me. Because <clears throat> there, there's still a lot of conjecture over whether or not they're viable. But kind of my own personal subjective experiences, they're phenomenal. Um, basically, you pull your blood, you centrifuge it down, you separate out the PRP. And then inside the PRP, you have all these growth factors that everybody's aware of, but you also have these things called very small embryonic-like stem cells. And they're, they're embryonic-like because they're pluripotent, which mm. just means that they can differentiate into anything. But they're, they're quiescent, which just means they're dormant until you activate them and you have to activate them with some sort of hormetic stress, whether it's, you know, cold shock therapy or light. Um, the best activation I've seen is with lasers, right? Mm -hmm. So I've heard really good things about lasers. It's fantastic. Yeah. So in my lab, I developed this thing that's, it's kind of a combination of a couple. So we call it cryophotonic activation of V cells. And so that's what I would do is I would have a full bottomist come in, we'd pull the blood and then we do this cryophotonic activation, isolate them and then re-inject them. Very and, cool, man. Yeah, and I did six cycles of that over seven weeks. And I think those two things were probably the two single biggest needle movers. That's um, very cool. Yeah, I, I mean, the proof's in the pudding, right? You know, I was up and walking at just a couple of weeks. And, I mean, not well, and I and it, it was hard. But, you know, by the nine-week mark, I had the the full clear from uh, from the orthopedic surgeon who <laughs> who I, I went in in a wheelchair for good form and he, he looked at my uh, X rays that day and he goes so honestly are you in the chair just for me and I was like nah I kind of sort of use it some <laughs> that's so, <laughs> so cool because it, you know at the nine week mark I was able to get up and just walk around which was mm -hmm. awesome you know that beat the hell out of twelve weeks before you can put any pressure on it to start doing any sort of physical conditioning totally. You know? so, 
I mean, at the 12 week mark, I was walking around carrying my backpack, doing everything I normally do. So I'm, it'll probably be a couple of weeks before I'm back on my bike, but you know, that'll yeah, be for sure. Week. I'm yeah. going to bookmark you there real quickly. Okay. And we are back. All right. And that's what I love about podcasting is it's, this is true and authentic to actual human interaction. It's a little bit messy. People are going to need to use the restroom. Sometimes there's barking dogs or crying babies. And that's just part of, you know, navigating like a real conversation. It's not fabricated and, you know, reading off of a teleprompter. And so I, I just think it's important for our audience to take that into consideration, you know. Have you ever done that? I actually I did a thing and I had to read off a teleprompter. It is the weirdest thing. Like, yeah, it's, I, it's rough. It was yeah, it was kind of like uh, I felt like you know Ricky Bobby like uh, you know my hands were moving. Well, what's rock. interesting about it is uh, I don't know if you're this way with with cognition and memory, but when I read things or I hear a quote or I hear something, it's like it elicits some sort of story or something that I want to share in the in between. So yeah. inevitably, I go off script and I want to come back to the teleprompter, and then I screw up the whole thing. And so, <laughs> yeah, it was a, it was it was a less than thrilling experience when I had to do that. I was like, because it felt so awkward, right? Yeah. Like, I actually I love people, and so I like interacting with people, and you know, that's really pleasant to me. But like reading things off of a teleprompter was like the most robotic, like, you know, yeah, no bueno. I should have just hired somebody that, you know, it would read like this, you know, like yeah. the 1984 Apple. So I will say something that, that stands out is, um, audiobooks, right? Like oh, I, I actually really enjoy them because I would prefer to listen while folding laundry or doing dishes or going for a drive. But more importantly, what I really love is in between chapters, what a lot of authors are doing now is they're giving real time cognition of the events that they aforementioned within the context of their writing. Really? And so I like the real time podcast style description of, oh, yeah, this part in the story, this is what I was feeling. And this is, you know, a, a more detailed elaboration that's not always in the written format. I know David Goggins did that with his first iteration of Can't Hurt Me. And a few a few other authors have done that. And oh um, I just God, think it's awesome. Cracks me up, man. He he is like that guy is like a juggernaut, right? Like, yeah. So then my foot fell off sideways. Yeah. Running, you know, like what? Dude, he was on Rogan the other day, and I guess there was some imaging on his knee, and they saw that it was like bone on bone, and he's like, "Yeah, get after it, stay hard," doing his traditional stuff, which is incredibly motivating and inspiring to so many, including myself. And, and I love the, the, the cursing involved with it. It's just so much passion, which I love. But what I also am intrigued by is like, he's not getting up and feeling like a million bucks. No. He's getting up and he's like pushing through the pain threshold while doing insurmountable things. And I don't know, there's something to that. But I also secretly am hoping that he listens to this. So that way we can get him taking some of the carbon 60 compounds to decrease some of his inflammation, yeah, no decrease pain, and then probably take his mileage and pull up record to a whole new level, especially if taking the Olympic RX as well. Actually, yeah, it, it 100%. I, and just because I admire the cat and what he does and how he approaches things, open invitation if, you know, if he ever wants to roll down and get some therapeutic stuff done. I'm happy to do it and put a team together to do that because he's the, the guy, the way he approaches things really is seriously admirable. It's just like motor through, you know, kind of champion victorious approach Invictus, right? So, I mean, it's just mm -hmm. like, you just don't stop. You keep doing what you're doing and you keep rolling through it. It's, it, it, it does. It's kind of a beautifully daunting. Like I mean, you did the same thing though with your injury. You know, if we go back to the storytelling component of your injury, I can't help, but you know, note the, the famous Viktor Frankl, right? Man's search oh, yeah. for meaning between stimulus and response. There's a space yeah. in that space is our power to choose. And you had the choice to get cut on, get metal plates put into your framing or choose yeah. an alternate approach. That's maybe a little bit more homeopathic against the grain, not as much clinical research per se, but you believed in it. And I think there's value within the belief system and the proof is in the pudding because three months and Six days later, you're up and walking, twirling in your awesome maroon jacket that we alluded to before. 
<laughs> yeah, no, the proof is in the pudding. And, and that was, I mean, it, it, granted, it was a, a calculated approach. And I, I asked the orthopedic surgeon, you know, like, are you familiar with pulse electromagnetic field work? And, you know, the answer was no, what's that? You know, and, and so I've been exposed to a lot of different things. I mean, the guy was very well meaning, and I think he really had, uh, you know, my best interest at heart. But he's very much locked in the confines of the standard of care. And the standard of care is, you know, frankly, it's like 21st century standard of care. It's pretty bad. You know, like there, there's so many things, so many different approaches medically that people could take if they would broaden their horizons a bit. And I, you know, I have the benefit of having access to a lot of those tools and techniques and data sets. And so I just applied when I know, you know, and, and, and I did, I mean, legitimately, yeah, I'm back up and running and it was a, brutal accident. In fact, at the first week mark, when I went into the orthopedic surgeon, you know, I was moving my arm because my collarbone had already started to fuse back together. And, and I said, look, I'd like to get x-rays in the, in the orthopedic surgeon said, well, there's no point. Um, and I said, well, no, I, you know, I, I want, I've been working on this and, you know, using pulse electromagnetic fields, I'd like to have some x-rays. And he was like, there's no point. He's like, you're not going to have radiographic healing. He's like, the only reason you can move your arm is there's a decrease in swelling. And so that's diminished. So that's it. And I said, well, it's on me. It's my dime. Let's just do the x-rays. So, you know, I, he sent me back and I got the x-rays and he came back and he was walked in with his iPad and he was looking at it and he showed it to me and he goes, do you see this? And I said, yeah. And he goes, that's new bone. It's already connected. Like it reconnected in a week. And I was like, yeah, that's awesome. And he's like, huh. And actually what he said, he goes, well, I guess you are smarter than the average bear, you know? <laughs> you know, and it was just like, but it's not really. I mean, it was different because he just hadn't heard it, but that was in keeping with all of the studies that I had looked at and what people's expectations, you know, had been like in about a week, you're going to see some moderate bone growth and reconnecting. And, and luckily enough, it actually connected in the right spot. Downside was I, because my leg was out of commission and I was using crutches, you know, at, at the second week and I was trying to get around with a broken collarbone that was only partially mended. I rebroke the collarbone, which was less than thrilling when that happened. Mm. Um, so then I had to kind of start over for that. And I, and I think ultimately my leg healed probably better than my collarbone did because, because of rebreaking it. But, you know, it is what it is. It's uh, everything. I mean, a big takeaway here though is just... The limited mindset of the 21st century um, health health model around no that that protocol will not enhance bone growth, and I th I think remaining open minded and malleable to the potentials of magic and to the potentials of certain protocols that have not been explored consistently or in depth or the funding was not funneled that way. And I think you did a really cool job there that my hope is, is at least in that particular gentleman's headspace and those that he's involved with, it elicits a little bit of open-mindedness and perspective to, all right, these, I, I know a lot about this, but maybe there's some things that I don't know. And I can continue the learning journey and experience and, and have this sponge-like approach. Yeah. And that, that's my hope and my pray with regards to a lot of these different conversations is just trying to add tools to the toolbox rather than just being like, Nope, those are the only tools that are available. Yeah. Well, that's, that's kind of my prayer too, is like, once you, once you have exposure to different constructs and you know that there's something more that's capable of being performed in, in a different configuration or something, it's kind of incumbent upon you to share, right? Like that's how humanity progresses is, we do it, we test it, it works, we share the data, you know, we don't hoard it. That's that's actually this one unfortunate thing about the way that, you know, both academia works and business is everything is kind of built around the, the scarcity mindset of like, ah, you know, I've, I've discovered this great thing, I have to lock down the intellectual property, I can't share it, you know, because that's, that's how I'm going to be receiving funding or some sort of compensatory thing for it. And that's totally backwards. I mean, as a species, that doesn't really bode well for our survival. What would bode really well is, you know, like if everybody kind of sang Kumbaya, which I'm not naive enough to think is going to actually happen. But, you know, for those of us who are really pushing the bounds, I kind of feel like it's that's what I'm supposed to do, right? Like I'll use myself, push the bounds, figure some stuff out, fail a lot. But on the things that I do come up with that are correct, share it, you know, get it out there so other people can work on it. Like, like the carbon 60 thing, right? It's definitively not going to be the best longevity thing that's ever out there 
it's the best one I've seen, right? And I and I know you know there's there's the V cell therapy that definitively shows some regression of aging. There's a fellow named Shia Fradi who's a doctor in Israel that did some with uh, hyperbaric chambers where they showed age, age regression and you know telomere lengthening and shifts in your T cell counts that that occurred after doing hyperbaric five days a week for six weeks. Actually, the study was 12 weeks, but really, if you if you read all the data sets, the, the kind of the big preponderance of all the shifting occurs in the the 30 day mark, 30 days mm. of treatment. So, um, at the six week mark, and then uh, then there's a, a fellow named Greg Fahey, who's uh, probably the top cryobiologist in the world, um, really sharp cat, and he's got a thymic regeneration technique that also shows age regeneration. And there's a friend of mine, Dave Sinclair, who has another thing using Yamanaka factors, which are these you know, genetic factors that they use viral vectors for to change the age inside the cells. So like, there's a lot of people that are working on longevity and we're all trying to get it out there. But the one I'm playing with is it's, I think, and granted I'm biased, but I, I think it's got the, the best potential impact, um, but it's not gonna be for long, right? Again, point on a line, I'm just one point on a line. And that's, that's why I'm trying to get this stuff out is because it, like in case in point with your dog, right? A little, mm -hmm. little bit of an impediment in terms of mobility, you start taking the serum, knocks out the inflammatory response, upregulates ATP production, problem's gone. You know, yeah. he, it's, it's uh, able to compensate. He's able to compensate for that, that increased load by virtue of just better biochem, you know? It's really, it's really interesting to me how you're, you're finding ways to get this into people's hands and you know hopefully conversations like this help motivate educate inspire and entertain people to to, to kind of get on board what what are the different formulas that you guys have we briefly alluded to the neural which we kind of went in depth with a little bit as far as personal usage and experience especially for me in the podcast space but then and also helping with alzheimer's right. but then there's also this olympic rx where Sam Dancer, good friend of mine, longtime Invictus athlete. He and yeah. I collaborated, ch chit chatted briefly about it. And it was really cool to hear his personal case study associated with it, to, to not only hear his words, but watch his eyebrows perk, see his eyes light up, and hear some of his personal experience with the Olympic RX as far as not just muscle contractility and load lifted, but also in conjunction with, you know, some of his, his, times with regards to mile splits oh, and yeah. so with, with with peak performers always seeking that edge of superhuman performance you know blaine mcconnell's another good friend invictus athlete in the past that uh <laughs> is putting up superhuman numbers consistently oh my God. every day um, blaine you know stuff. these are these are fun friends of mine that i, I you know we chit chat briefly about it i see him posting about it and you know hopefully we can get this stuff into other people's hands as well but you know, obviously high performers, these aren't guys bottom of the barrel, just screwing around in a 24 hour fitness. Like these are guys that are top notch within their field. The, you know, one of the things I love about both of those guys, both Sam and Blaine, it, because in you too, you guys track your metrics. Like, so mm -hmm. it's not, and this is why Sam reached out to me right when he first started taking the Olympic is he had arrived at getting it through a, through another person who told him like, you should try this. So he tried it. And his numbers were off the charts. Like he put up a lift that he hadn't been able to put up for seven years. And then he had his fastest running time ever, right? His splits were faster than they had ever been. And so he reached out to me like almost instantly and said, is this legal? <laughs> you know, and I said, yeah. yeah, it's totally legal. And he ran all the traps. And we reached out to, to Curtis from the CrossFit yeah. drug testing team and the USADA team and saw that yeah. it's all drug free sport approved and right. there's no banned substances in it. So yeah. I was like, whoa, we were all jaw dropped. Yeah, well, the thing is, it's just it's it's kind of like if somebody dropped a bunch of bicycle parts in front of you and you built the thing, and instead of the front wheel, you put the sprocket there. That's kind of how a lot of you know sports science stuff fares right now, and a lot of you know nutraceuticals and things like that. It's sort of close, but it's not really like the right configuration. And I think one of the things that's good is we've actually got a really legit configuration of how that like the macro molecular stuff is set up, right? Like there's there's a buffer solution that delivers it and you know different lipids are used to deliver different components. That's why the base lipid for neural is different than Olympic, right? Because it distributes differently in your body. One's metabolized in your GI system, one goes to your liver, fractionates and you know becomes beta hydroxybutyrate. Like they all use the body's kind of brilliance to parse out the different components where they need to go. 
And so if you build the bicycle the right way with those parts, you have a cool bike, right? If you build it the wrong way, you have this kind of broken contraption. Yeah. It doesn't move right. And I know like when, when Sam reached out, he was kind of blown away because his numbers were just on day one after taking one dose were off the charts. But it, it's literally just straight up better biochemistry, right? So instead of kind of working from the outside in, I'm working from the inside out. I take the cells and I modulate intracellular output from the mitochondria up, right? So the mitochondria start pumping out these crazy numbers of ATP enhancement, mixing their own oxidative load and their inflammatory response. And literally everything functions better. So the cells function better then the sarcomeres function better inside the muscles. So you get better contractile reactions. And then, and all of that actually is a dose dependent function. So you can do these like, you know, and I, and I've told all of you guys about this, you know, because all of you guys are top performers, you actually have to limit your own performance because you can kind of elicit these muscle states that aren't natural, right? Like your muscles will fire fully. Normally your brain down regulates your sarcomeric firing to 25 to 30% of capacity. But if you dope yourself fully, like if you, if you completely imbibe the cells with a lot of this, you can bypass that function and you'll, the, the term is super precipitate the skeletal muscle actomycin, just meaning that you can fire everything in one shot. So it's kind of, it's on you to say like, oh, I want to fire 50% of my muscle fibers or I want to fire 60%. And if you're, you know, your normal deadlift is 500 pounds, well, legitimately you can do a thousand pounds. Now, should you? Hell no. You know, because your tendons and your ligaments are not designed to do that. It, it's yeah, the equivalent might take of a toll. You know, like having access to what you'd experience from fight or flight, right? It's like as if your body had just completely blasted itself with adrenaline, you have yeah. the same capacity, but you don't want to do that, right? So, you, you know, it just, it, it puts it more under your own control, which is, I think, kind of one of the coolest things about it. So like the Olympic serum, it distributes throughout most of your, you know, your skeletal muscle. And so that gives you a different capacity and it also drops inflammatory response systemically. Uh, neural goes to the brain and then the, the, uh, the other components, um, there's one for longevity that, that hasn't actually been released. I know you've, you've taken that. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that the same thing that is in a different lipid profile so that it upregulates stem cell production. And it's got, you know, a compound in it called urolithin A, which triggers mitophagy, which is just, you know, you don't necessarily want to trigger autophagy. Autophagy is where your body kills the cells off. And that's a very expensive way to do things. It's kind of like saying, oh, the car needs new spark plugs, throw away the car, right? <laughs> you, know, you know, I mean, that's preposterous in that analogy. But when you trigger large scale autophagy, that's really kind of what it is. It's better yeah. if you trigger mitophagy and you go in and go like, all right, cool, let's swap the plugs. So you swap out the mitochondria and then you use like PQQ or quinolone to upregulate the production of those things. And you just build a basic better body from the inside out. And so the, the other formulas are, you know, like there's a one that's called elixir, which is it's just an organic fraction of coconut oil that's bound to C60. And it it's beautiful. It's like this gorgeous purple color, um, which <laughs> I wish I had some handy. I'd show it to you because it looks fantastic. Um, but those are the bases that I use to build the other products. And so it's just, it's kind of a using the body's own innate intelligence to say, okay, what am I trying to do here? Like if I'm trying to upregulate stem cell production, I have to use these compounds in this configuration to get the body to do its thing, right? You give it all of the tools and with all the tools at its disposal, it will do whatever you're trying to do. So they're really, sure. we don't actually, we don't actually have a ton of, products out you know there's one for dogs um there's another one that'll be coming out soon for cats um a lot of people actually use it for equine things so there's there's one fella who's fixed a disease called kissing spine in two of his horses uh which is not supposed to be a treatable thing other than by surgery but we reversed that and got rid of it um, incredible yeah it really is actually that's the thing is i, I mean me too. You know, I mean, not only do I get to play with this stuff, but I'm, I'm playing with it because it's intriguing. You know, like I, I'm lucky that I'm on the front lines because I actually get to see all this stuff, you know, and I've played with a bunch of other cool stuff. Like there's molecular hydrogen is really neat. Um, you know, the hyper oxygenation tech is really cool. Some of the quantum tech I'm playing with is really cool, but still the, the best thing I've seen so far is still this, you know, the C60 stuff. I, I'm, yeah. I'm hoping that at some point in the very near future, you know, maybe 
a couple of years, I, I'm able to drop the the cost of it because it's still, you know, even buying in huge quantities, it's still, you know, roughly like 40,000 bucks a, a kilo. So, that's, yeah. you know, it's really crazy pricey. Yeah, it's expensive for sure. It, it is. But what is it about like combining it with a ketogenic diet? And, you know, to, to define that, mostly protein and fat where the body's eliciting ketones and very, very low carbohydrate, if any, mm -hmm. um, integrated into the diet. Can you help define that a little bit for our audience? Yeah. So one of the, the when you look at the electron transport chain, there are different complexes in the electron transport chain. And if you're doing um, a lot of sugars, the flow path is different. If you're, if you're basing yourself in a ketogenic state, um, you're able to more evenly regulate the flow. And, and a lot of times what happens in your mitochondria where you're actually producing ATP and getting the energy to, to come out, um, you'll, you'll push through the complex really quickly. And that's not so good. What you actually want is the C60 wedges in the mitochondrial membrane and forms an oxidative buffer. And if you couple that with um, something that puts you in a ketogenic state, what you end up with is a cycle where you actually recapture some of the lost electrons. And so mm -hmm. between the balance of electrons and protons, you actually are enhancing the system. So in ketosis, you end up with a, with a much better uh, process. We have, we have a thing called keto new, which does that. It's a, it's a, um, a ketone ester combined with uh, a serum that's really similar to the neural. And it does exactly that. It forcibly puts you in ketosis so that you don't lose things in the electron transport chain, you recycle them. So you build up this kind of buffer on the front of the mitochondria where normally it would be expended or it would oxidize and cause damage like singlet oxygen production. And instead of losing it or having detriment from it, it actually recycles it until you process all of it through. And Interesting. So would you recommend that highly competitive athletes that you know typically are utilizing high high doses of carbohydrate for fuel and you know some of the anaerobic components of their sport integrate more of a ketogenic diet when combined with these things? Or would you say this is more for health and longevity and decreased inflammatory biomarkers? Both. I, I think ultimately we're going to see a shift towards really hardcore competitive athletes. You probably using things like this in combination with ketogenic diets. I mean, I can tell you from working on the, the cancer front, the, the difference is remarkable. And, and it's sometimes it's a lot easier to see the contrast in a physical system when things are marginalized. And the people that I've worked with that have cancers they're very marginalized and you can see a huge shift in their performance and their quality of life and their output and their energy levels um, far easier than you can in somebody who's healthy, right? Like in a person who's healthy, your body kind of buffers it. And a person who's super marginalized or is going through chemo or something like that, when you put them in ketosis and then you, you know, bump them up in terms of energy production with some of this stuff, it's literally a night and day difference. And I, and I actually get texts. I had one today. I get text messages about that kind of stuff every day. Um, in fact, I have a cookbook that you know kind of outlines the whole protocol. That's a keto cookbook that you can get on Amazon um, for that very thing. I'll, I'll send you a copy. It's it's actually it's great. It was written by. I definitely want to check that out. Something you and I have also discussed a little bit is this deuterium depleted water. We we yeah. touch on that a little bit and kind of define it and how it fits within kind of the protocol of the the C sixty serum the ketogenic diet, and then the deuterium depleted water? Yeah. So deuterium, for those who don't know, like when you talk about H2O, you know, just standard water, the H is protium, right? So there's there's one proton, one orbital electron. Uh, deuterium is a proton, a neutron, and one orbital electron. So it's got twice the mass of water. So when your body takes in water, it processes it. It actually breaks it down and reprocesses it so that it's in a, in a form you can actually utilize. And your mitochondria have these little nanoscopic rotors that actually spool at about 9,000 RPMs. And they're kind of weighted based on the atomic mass of the hydrogens that come in. And so I always liken it to like, if you're processing something like returning tennis ball serves from a tennis ball cannon, and you're just lobbing serves back and back and back, and then a ball comes across that's filled with lead, when it hits your arm, it's like hitting one of those rotors. It damages the rotor or slows it down greatly, and it, and it nixes mm. energy production. And so there are about, I don't know, probably seven or 800 different studies 
on uh, the effects of deuterium depleted water on cancer. And I, I'd recommend anybody go out and read them. The, there's a fellow named Laszlo Boros at uh, UCLA, who's uh, and I think he's a pediatrician by training, but he's done the, the bulk of the study on deuterium depleted water. But it's phenomenal, right? It's like, like our bodies, kind of like the oxygen, you know, where we evolved with 21 part, 21 percent uh, oxygen, and now we have 19. Well, our bodies evolved at a pretty consistent rate of about 130 ish, 134 ish parts per million deuterium. Well, now we have about 150, 354 parts per million worldwide in all of the water. And there's a lot of conjecture about why that is. My personal take is that um, since we use deuterium uh, like heavy water, we use it in nuclear reactor cores. Uh, to cool the fuel rods, and then according to the the lovely guys at the Atomic Energy Commission, since it's not radioactive, all you need to do to dispose of it is just dump it in the water in the ocean. Um, and oddly enough, in the past sixty years, the rates of deuterium have gone up, you know, twenty parts per million. So, so we've got something that we're not designed to process that's really impeding our intracellular function. And so, if you can take that out of the water. Uh, then you get these phenomenal responses. I actually quite literally just had an email about this today because I always recommend that for people when they're they're fighting with cancer, shift to a ketogenic diet, step number one. Get on deuterium depleted water, step number two. Those are like absolute go-tos. You know, I always tell them to take C60 because I'm very biased and think, you know, because, well, I actually have, I've done the studies to see what the effect is, but the two big go-tos, First thing I would do if I were diagnosed with cancer tomorrow uh, would be to switch to a fully ketogenic diet all the time, you know, like a real hardcore keto diet. And then the second thing would be to start taking deuterium depleted water so that your body can up its energetics, right? Like cancer exists oddly kind of in this very narrow bandwidth. Um, and if you have enough energy, your body overcomes it. If you have too little energy, your cells die. And so it can only function in sort of a narrow bandwidth. Um, there was some some study on that done uh, at the University of uh, Spain in Bilbao a couple of years back where they isolated, you know, like the, the energetic p potential in uh, electron volts that you, that you actually, cancer could only survive between these couple of brackets. Mm, uh, that's interesting. Yeah. And so you just, you know, that's what I would tell people is, you know, shift to deuterium depleted water, but it's really expensive for now. I was going to say, where, where can you get it from? Well, there are a couple of companies. There's uh, Preventa, Lightwater. Um, they they're both good companies, and that's you know what I always tell people. I always feel kind of guilty recommending it to people though because it's so insanely expensive. Um, but shortly, I actually myself and some uh, some other fellows have developed a way to make it at the cost of normal water. So we're going to be producing it at just straight up cost of normal water. So, and, and it's really, for me, it's just kind of a passion project because I always feel guilty recommending it to people who have cancer because it's so stupidly expensive. And I, I want to be able to, to just say like, yeah, just go here and buy it. It's the cost of normal water. And this is what I love about you, man, is you're, you're creating lower barriers to entry to, you know, help people. And, and it's, it's real. It's not, you know, funneled by dollars and cents or notoriety or significance. It's just around... Cancer has been a big problem for a really long time. Here's some tools to help you navigate a really, really hard thing. And yeah. well, I mean, seriously, it, like if you had cancer and somebody else had a pivotal key to the information that could really help you, I would hope that they would share, right? And that's mm -hmm. kind of like I have a special skill set, and so I kind of feel like it's very much incumbent upon me to share share that knowledge and try to help where I can. I mean you got a very fixed amount of time on the planet, right? So it, it's not, it's not like I have a, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years to do this. I mean, even though I've pushed the longevity curve and hopefully, you know, we'll know in 50 years if it worked, if I'm still bopping around when I'm over a hundred feeling <laughs> super dry. Um, yeah. Then it, then it jived, you know, but, but in the meantime, yeah, I really do believe that we're here to, to help one another. Pushing the needle, man. Yeah, there man, you that, have that, it, guys. That's it. That's, a, little, a little peek behind right. the curtain with an incredible innovator, an inventor, a biochemist, a pharmaceutical developer that's so full of kindness, innovation, practicing the art of safety third, as you heard <laughs> through his miraculous story of just, just healing himself after a very traumatic motorcycle accident. 
and you know finding ways to help people navigate cancer, educate, motivate, and inspire through the carbon sixty compound. Ion, it's it's been such such an honor connecting with you today. Are there any last minute thoughts that you'd love to share with our community as to uh, you know some of the cool things that you're up to? Um, yeah, actually, the one thing I would recommend just because it was very transformative to me is there's a fellow named David Hawkins who wrote a book called power versus force. Mm -hmm. And I think that was probably like the single most transformative thing I've ever read. Truly brilliant. He was an MD PhD and just a genuinely smart guy. I would not actually buy the book and read it. I would get it on audible and listen to it. Um, There's just something kind of crazy soothing about the guy's voice. Like you, you want to listen to him and he's just like this kind of jovial old cat who just makes you kind of joy filled just to listen to. And, but it, but it's a brilliant work and it just, it reframes a lot of, I think what we experience day to day, but it also, it also really expresses like human connectivity and how we're all intrinsically linked and, and sort of what, what's really called upon for us to do and to help with everybody else. And so, yeah, I just say, you know, closing words, be kind and, uh, you know, not, not as a platitude, but truly just like help where you can. And, uh, everybody's got special talents. Just use, use your gifts, you know, for the benefit of everything. So that's it. For sure, man. Anything you, anytime you find something isolated by itself, it's usually connected to everything else in the universe. (laughs) Yeah. Well said, very well said. It was an honor connecting with you. Thanks for doing this, man. We'll absolutely have to do it again. There's so many iterations from from the first time I spoke with you to now that uh, I want to continue to share those with our audience. And I know you're always pushing the boundaries and asking deeper, more meaningful questions. So we'll definitely have to do this again. All right. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Much love, Bryce. Peace out, man. Much love, buddy. If you guys enjoyed my conversation with Ion Mitchell today, please rate, review, subscribe, and check him and his brand and company out over at Wizard Sciences as they're innovatively just pushing the boundaries of all things health and longevity. Man, that was cool. I am fired up for the rest of the day. Right on, And man. as always, guys, stay on the hunt for who you've not yet become. Till next time. Are you over 35 and in need of a solid training program? Are you looking to improve your athleticism and keep up with the younger athletes in your CrossFit gym? Then look no further than our Invictus Masters program. This program places year-round emphasis on mobility and stability exercises with movements that we have seen directly benefit our Masters athletes. Our program is led by Nicole DeHart and offers a training program designed specifically for Masters athletes who are looking to compete at a higher level in the sport of CrossFit. Some of our top Masters athletes in the world train with us, including CrossFit Games champion Kevin Kester, Matt Beals, and Pat Sprague. You can learn more about their stories and the Invictus Masters program by checking out their episodes right here on the Invictus Mindset Podcast. If you'd like more information about the current training cycle or to join the Invictus Masters program, please email Nicole at InvictusAthlete.com. That's N-I-C-H-O-L-E at InvictusAthlete.com.